It's my great pleasure to introduce Christophe Michel, who is the head of the CIBM EEG Huguenich Clinical and Translational Neuroimaging Section, who will be chairing this uh, CIBM Breakfast and Science Seminar session number 15. And I'd like to invite Christophe to uh, introduce the, the guest. Yes, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, of course, to introduce uh, Thomas Koenig, an uh, old friend of mine since many, many years. Thomas is uh, currently a uh, professor at the uh, psychiatry clinic in, in Bern, at the University Clinic of Psychiatry in Bern, and he is also invited professor at the University of Geneva, uh, working with me together. He is as a biologist at the, at the base. He has studied national sciences, natural sciences at the ETH in Zurich, where he received his diploma in the 90s, 1991, I checked it out <laughs> correctly. <laughs> He was then working in Zurich at the University Clinic, at the Neurology Clinic of the University Hospital in Zurich with Dietrich Lehmann, who you might know, the mentor of myself and of him for many years. He did his postdoc in a bizarre place, namely Havana in Cuba, together with Pedro Valdez, and also a bit in New York, together with Roy John, two pioneers in EEG. He then moved to the University Hospital of Psychiatry in Bern, as I said, with a Bernard Strick, where he was first a uh, senior research assistant and habilitated and became a professor uh, at this uh, university. He uh, is a specialist in EET, and I don't want to take too much time to introduce him because we rather want to listen about his uh, EET analysis techniques, especially microstates he's going to talk about. Uh, just one thing to mention maybe that he received the uh, very prestigious Theodore Kocher Prize in the University of Bern some, some years ago. And he's president of, was president, he's past president of ISPET, which is an international society with quite some, some, some important history where he also organized several, uh, several interesting meetings in Bern and elsewhere. But I, I rather let Thomas talk and Hopefully, uh, we can have questions also during the talk, but also after. Thomas. Yes, thank you. So I will talk about EEG microstates as Christoph has introduced this, and I will try to make a link to modes of conscious experience. And that is, of course, on one side, a really big issue because all this relationship between the mental phenomena that we have and the biology, that's totally up in the air. I'm, uh, as a whole, I also study philosophy of mind as, at the university, and this is a really big and very open issue. And I'm not going into this in detail, which, which is assumed that this happens in some way. But I will just add, or I, I will just start out, out with two, I think, quite uncontroversial assumptions about conscious experience on one side and about the EEG on the other side. And I will think, and I will then try to convince you that we can link this in, an, in a way that is in, really interesting to do research about things that we are interested, in, namely uh, mental disorders um, and these type where, where our way of experiencing is altered in, in important ways. Okay. And the, the first assumption that I start out with is based on this. this uh, I need... Ah, okay. Now I made this advance. Okay, this is based on Giulio Tononi's uh, theory about consciousness, where he basically says that information integration is a necessary condition for conscious experience. This is. May, it's maybe not the case that this is a sufficient condition, right? But if we, we if, for the argument that I want to make, it is enough to say that it is a necessary condition uh, that information is being integrated to have a conscious experience. If we don't have this integration, then we will fail to produce a conscious experience. So here is a, a figure from a paper of a collaborator of Giulio Tononi, where we have this unconscious integration, there's just a unidirectional flow of information and it is segregated. Here we have different parts. Here we have what they call a minimally conscious integration here where we have uh, 
still islands of information being integrated, but we have bidirectional information uh, exchange here. And here we have this fully conscious state where everything is in some way connected and integrated. Information is flowing in both directions. And this is in a way a holistic and, and global process. That Thomas, sorry, to, to, we don't see your laser pointer. Or your ah, okay. All right. Uh, Okay, now it's better? Better, thank you. All right, okay. So I moved from this part here where we have this unconscious integration, unidirectional, isolated uh, islands of integration here to a fully integrated, holistic, global state of integration. Okay, and there's another thing that I think is really important to add here. And there's also a lot of theoretical background on this, of course, and I don't have to go into this, is that the flow of information in both directions, so the, bot the bottom up and the top down flow of information is both incomplete. We need to integrate this and, and, and we need to add things, okay? Here we have a, a, a two-dimensional thing. This is a two-dimensional graph. Also what happens on the retina is two-dimensional, but we fundamentally see this it's something three-dimensional. Okay, there's, there's information being added, things that we know about how rooms are, about how our, our eyes functions and, and, and all this stuff, okay? Here, this is a classical example here, the, this necker cube type of thing here where we have an ambiguity that cannot be resolved because the information that we have, both the sensory information and the top-down information that we know about geometrical things, it's, it's, it's incomplete and we end up having two ways of integrating this. But we typically don't see this as 12 lines. We keep seeing this as a cube that is still ambiguous, okay? And just also here, the, um, okay, we have this. So, so we need this adaptive and dynamic integration of sensory input with pre-knowledge. We already have an idea how the world is and we map our sensory information onto this and the incoming information is constantly integrated into this. And we need to switch and change because this is by nature, not unique, the, the, the outcome of this and, and the type of representation that we can produce with this also. Here is another example. You can see this as a tree or as an Easter bunny, depending on what you want to see, right? You can switch back and forth. So, we, we have this switching and we need this all the time. And this is, I think, a, a vital thing and, and one of the functions of consciousness that we are able to switch this and to come to the different types of representations, depending on all kinds of circumstances, okay? And in terms of mechanisms, how, can, how does that, that implies that if we have information integration, we need to be able to switch. This is just, again, a, a, a simplification of Tononi's uh, model here. We have the, the non-integrated state here where we have just a unit, a monocausal uh, flow from the input states to the output states to the response states here. This would not be able to produce consciousness. Um, if we have integration of information, we have again, input states and output states and each response state or output state here is affected by many of the input states, okay? And each input state is affecting uh, many of the response states. And we also have to be aware that information then is flowing in both directions. So we would have the same cross uh, interactions here in the other direction around, okay? And if we need to switch now, uh, okay, this is causally inter interdependent. And if we need to switch now, we, we must be able to gate this info. There must be something that is capable of gating this information, okay? To have this type of interaction and then switch to this type of interaction here, okay? And because th this is very dynamic, this needs to be fast. We have to, to talk about, uh, we cannot just, think of this as something of wires being changed, okay? But there, there needs to be a, a mechanism that can do this in a very quick and, and, and efficient way. And what, what we propose here is a model that Pascal Fries has introduced uh, quite a while ago. 
and this is uh, uh, this information uh, in integration through uh, coherence, right? If you think of just three nodes, and we can just think of this in an abstract way at the moment, and these three nodes have rhythmically uh, changing uh, levels of excitability. Here, this node, at, at this moment in time here, this node is highly excitable, and that this node, you need a lot of input to get this node excited. And then this just rhythmically fluctuates. And this node here shows the same fluctuation here. And that node here now shows a fluctuation that has the opposite phase angle. Okay, when, this, when these nodes here are maximally excitable, this node here is low in excitability. And when this node here is high in excitability, these nodes are low in excitability. And what that results, and this is uh, the, the, the idea of Pascal Fries is that like this, we have gating mechanisms, okay? When we have, when, when these slow oscillations of excitability are in sync, when they have the same phase, this allows for an efficient exchange of information for mutual excitability uh, between these two nodes. Whenever this node here is excitable and is excited, it's very likely that it will also excite uh, this node here and the other way around, okay? And the, the flow of information between these two nodes and also between the red and the black node is very efficiently blocked, okay? Whenever this node here is excited, is uh, uh, providing information this node here is not receptive. And whenever this node here is providing uh, or responsive to information, if you want to speak in, in these terms, these nodes here are silent basically, okay? So the proposal that, that we want to make is that there, 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 there is something in the brain that coordinates these slow oscillations of excitability. And by, by arranging the phase, of these relatively slow oscillations, we have a very efficient and cheap mechanism where we can open or close pathways uh, of information exchange through the, the, the anatomical structure that there is. We, the, the, there's no need to change anything in the structure. It's just the, the, this rhythm, this, the, the phase of these oscillations of excitability that provide a very efficient way of allowing or suppressing, suppressing the flow of information. Okay, so this is the theoretical background that I want to provide from one side. And now the, the next step that I want to do is I want to show that when we look at the EEG and when we study the EEG, when we model the EEG, we come actually to conclusions that, that very well match these types of mechanism. And that therefore the EEG seems to me really suited to, to study these type of modes of networks, of modes of network interaction. And that's at, at one point then also, I think, modes of conscious experience. And the, the starting ground is the EEG, of course. Um, this is the, the brain underneath. We already see that we may have some problems in getting the, the spatial details because there's quite something in between. There is, in terms of sensors that we have, there's a lot of spatial information that we need to account for. This is not something that I will go into. This is here in, in EEG, as we have measured, is we, we see these oscillations here. For example, we, we already are confronted with, at, at the very first glance at the EEG with oscillations, which is already related to what I have been talking about. And we can now, of course, read out this EEG uh, in these in these wave shapes, and we can also read it out as maps. And the only thing that I will add now in terms of theory about these maps is wh when these maps change, we must conclude that we have different sources in the brain. I will not go into source localization at all. This is not the field where I have uh, 
really worked on a lot where I'm more an end user into this. And for example, the, the lab of Christoph has done way more efforts into this. And I kind of rely on in many of the conclusions that I make also on, on this type of work. I'm more still into the, into the scalp stuff, and, but I will elaborate on this. And I think there are many interesting things that can be said on this. So we, we can study, when we can study the dynamic, when we study the dynamics of these maps over time, we can study the, the dynamics of the changes of the sources in the brain. Okay, and this is where microstates come in. Uh, here, I put here, hello, microstates. If we look at these map series now, this is just a, an EEG recorded in a healthy subject that is having the eyes closed, that is doing no task. This is what we call spontaneous activity, a self-organizing process, apparently time runs in this, in this direction here, like you read a, a newspaper, we have five milliseconds between all of these maps, between each of these maps. And we see already when we just at the beginning here, we see, for example, a, a configuration that looks like this. And it starts to reappear with an opposite polarity here. Okay. So the only thing that has changed here is what, what is positive and what is negative. There may be a, a, a reversal, a polarity reversal of similar sources here. And this is a phenomenon that, that we now observe really very frequently. Here is another thing like this. We have this configuration here with this pole here and this pole here. And then this kind of mirror image is here. Okay, to, and then this and this again looks quite similar. We keep seeing periods of time where we, where the whole scalp field is dominated by one configuration. Okay, I just point this out here. This would be, for example, such a, what we call now a microstate, the same configuration that just uh, changes in, in amplitude, it's getting stronger or weaker, and it's changing eventually in, in polarity, things that have been positive become negative and the other way around. And relatively little other thing that we will now, for the sake of simplicity at the moment, consider as noise. So if you model, if you want to produce these maps here with, or if you want to represent these dynamics here, a, a constant configuration that just changes in amplitude and in, in sign, in polarity, what you will come up with is an EEG or a, an element of an EEG that looks like this. Okay, these are the different electrodes. We don't need to care where they are. The important thing is that for, for this pattern here, th there must be a correlation of either one or minus one among, among all pairs of channels. Nothing else is possible if you want to explain this type of spatial behavior, okay? And the, the conclusions that you can draw in terms of sources without making any, any source localization is that this is either a, a single point source in the brain, which is a, I think, pretty absurd assumption. And the other assumption is that we actually have to consider the, this, the, the dynamics of the sources that account for an EEG like this as dynamics that, that follow these patterns. Okay, the, either the sources that, that we see are in phase, like the red source and the green source here, or they are in antiphase. Both of these uh, dynamics or both of these relationships are possible given that we see an EEG like this. What is not possible is that we have something in between, that we have sources that have a peak of these slow oscillations when these uh, when this region, for example, has a zero crossing. Okay, things need to be aligned either in phase or in antiphase. And this nicely coincides, co coincides with, with this model of pulse confidence. Okay, so 
what we do here when we do EEG microstate analysis from a theoretical background, we, 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 do, we do pattern recognition. We want to identify these microstates here. And then we, we, we think we are allowed to think of these patterns that we uh, recognize here as the, the, the EEG signatures of some adaptive neurocognitive networks that are eventually related to the type of conscious experience that the subject has. This may not be a sufficient condition, and I, I have reasons to believe that this is not a sufficient condition because we also see microstates when subjects are not conscious. So there, there may be other things important to this, like these high frequency things taking place that we may not map very well with, with our microstate analysis here. But I think it's, it's a necessary condition. It's, and it, it's a condition that accounts for the switching for the modes of information integration that is taking place. And uh, just to, to bolster this point a bit, I just start out with a study that is actually really complicated in methodology but that makes the, the point very well. Uh, this is a, a paper by Simon Schwab, a, a postdoc that was in our lab uh, for quite a while. And he looked at a combined EEG fMRI data in resting state. And he did this type of, uh, of pattern recognition in time frequency domain. So this makes things more complicated even. And he looked at the bold correlates of these time frequency microstate uh, dynamics here. And he found that depending on the spatial configuration that you have, you see different node, different sub regions of the thalamus to correlate with the appearance of, of these different microstate classes. Okay. And the thalamus is a classical pacemaker in, in this context. Uh, this is what most people would probably say, what, what, is, what, what are regions that coordinate cortical activity to be, to be in phase, to be at, or to be in antiphase and all this. And the thalamus is probably one of the candidate regions. And this, at the same time, the thalamus is not producing the EEG signal itself. Okay, so it, it really s tells us in, in a very strong way here that we have a, a coordinator of these cortical patterns that we observe here that is, that is in the thalamus. Depending on which thalamic subsystems are active, we see different cortical regions being integrated in, in, the, in the way that I have described. Okay, there's more to this, but I, I think this is beyond the, the, the time that I have to, to, to talk also about the methodology here. I want to come back to the, to the more classical approach that we have here to the pattern recognition as we typically do it in time domain. So the, the problem that we have here is we have an EEG here. This is four seconds in the life of a healthy subject. These are the map series as we have, have observed them. And then when we just take these maps now and we do a pattern recognition, this is what we need. We need to have we actually want to identify patterns that are stable over time. A, a classical pattern recognition uh, approach is k-means or other uh, clustering algorithms. And when we do this, when we apply a clustering algorithm to these maps here, we see that with a low, with a really low number of spatial configurations here of maps here, we are able to account for a large amount of variance of all these spatial configurations that we have observed here. There's an ongoing debate and a debate that we may not fully resolve about getting the true number of, of these classes. I'm, I'm hesitant whether these things exist, but this is a really, when you look at, at things in detail, you will see this when you look at things in, in the larger scale, you will keep seeing that there's a relatively low number of, of typical patterns that is able to explain the data. And you may need to choose, depending on the questions that you have, depending on the signal to noise ratios that you have, you may 
at one point need to choose a certain number that will be on the right level to tell the story, but it is going to be low and it's going to be very efficient in explaining the, the variance. Okay, so here I'm taking four classes here just to illustrate this. We can label them, I've colored labeled them here to, to make the point and then we can assign each moment in time to one of these microstate classes. So we have the, the green class here, for example, that lasts for about 200 milliseconds here. And we have this pink state, or this violet state here that lasts for another quite a while here. We have then again other states. And there is now this stability that I talked about already that we have a, a configuration that persists for a certain time. We see this here. It doesn't change all the time. We have a stability over time. There's another, uh, so th this is what I call the, the micro level here. There's a meso level also that we see states reappearing. Okay, we see the, the, this violet state here and here and here again. So it's not that the brain is producing a wild number of different microstate types. There seems to be a relatively low number of typical microstates that we keep observing over time in the same subject. There's a preferred repertoire, as Dietrich Lehmann uh, said this, of, of microstates that are revisited again and again. And this is a nice graph that Christoph made for a review paper that I was happy to work uh, on with him uh, two years ago. When you look across studies, you keep finding these same or relatively similar maps across studies, across basically the entire literature and, and, and different populations, children, healthy subjects, uh, subjects with mental problems, elderly subjects, uh, you go into sleep, you see similar maps. There seems to be a really a, a very robust and stable set of microstate classes that just replicates, that seems to be biologically um, hardwired, so to say. Okay, this is just one of the first studies here. Uh, this study here, where we also then showed, where we started to look at what happens, how do they, how do they change uh, across age. This is the duration of these states here. And we see that there's a typical developmental trajectory. Children have different durations of these different microstate classes here compared to adults, for example. There's a maturation, and then there may be a degeneration at later ages and things like that. But basically children show similar classes of microstates compared to adults, for example. So this is a very, very stable biological phenomenon that we have. Okay, this is just to continue and it stops somewhere here, but the, the literature is coming out again with the same microstate classes again and again. Uh, now, I wanted to move into schizophrenia for a moment because we were interested, we, I, I talked about different modes of conscious experience and I think we can consider schizophrenia as a, 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 a disorder of consciousness, the way people experience things, the way people think about things is altered. It's not altered in a, in a random way, it's altered in ways we, also experience sometimes, for example, when we fall asleep, we have a lot of phenomena that one would call psychotic if we would be awake while we sleep. So it's, 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 it's about modes of thinking, modes of integra integrating information or not integrating information that I think is, is somewhere at the root of, of the problems that we see in schizophrenia, talking on, on this very high level. And in the, in, in 1999, this is now really long time ago, we published a first paper on this with just nine patients and 18 controls. And we found that there was one microstate class that was actually shortened in, in patients with schizophrenia. There were many follow-up studies 
on, on this here, this is a, a little a micro meta analysis we did on, on the papers that were around at the time we did this in 2016. The, the literature keeps being increasing. And here we have this initial finding here that the duration of this microstate, that we call microstate class D here, is reduced. This kept being replicated in the different studies that we have here. This is the percent time spent in, in, this, in, in this microstate class D here. The interesting thing is also that the first study was the one with the largest effect size and with the smallest sample. Okay, this is kind of typical for a discovery, I think. <laughs> other, other studies had more issues in replicating this, but overall this holds. There's also a quite some literature that shows that this microstate class C here, another class is increased in patients with schizophrenia. This is also a lot of contributions from the from Christoph's group that worked on this. For, for a while, there was a controversy, be, controversy between Bern and Geneva, where the Geneva people said it's an increase of C, and the Bern people said it's a decrease of D, and actually, the, there seems to be quite a balance. It's, it's really the, the, the two getting out of balance, and there's a shift from this class D to the class C that seems to be related to, to, to the psychopathology that we observe. Okay, this keeps evolving. Here is a paper by Laura Diaz who showed that you can do neurofeedback on these microstate classes. So we would eventually be able to modify this, to train people. Uh, we are with Thomas Ross, who is also here and a, a professor in Argentina. We're currently working on trying this out and really having patients with schizophrenia go into this neurofeedback training. We hope we can get this to work and, and also have some clinical benefits. Here is a paper from the uh, group from Christina Andreu, who was working in Basel at that time when she did this. She showed that th these microstate changes that we observe here are already present in patients that are at, at a high risk of developing schizophrenia and that they are already predictive for a conversion to psychosis. Okay, this is things that are just coming out now. And here is a paper from the APFL, actually, from the from Yanni Ramos da Cruz, from Michael Herzog's group, who showed that we see similar uh, changes in in these EEG microstates, also in unaffected siblings of uh, patients with schizophrenia. So this is some. This is an evolving story. Uh, where things are really open at the moment. We are at the moment working on, on these states uh, at the transition between wakefulness and sleep, where we have this hypnagogic hallucinations, where we have these funny ways of thinking. When you wake up, you think, this is absurd. How could I th even think this? And it looks like this shifts in the same direction. Okay, this control of what is real, what makes sense, what is logical, seems to get lost while we fall asleep. And this seems to be also problematic in, in patients that suffer from these psychotic experiences. And, and this is an, an, evolve, an, an, an evolving and I think very interesting story. Okay, here is, how am I in, how am I in time, Christoph? I think you're still okay. It's about 35 minutes that you... Were All right. Talking. Okay. So I will, I will skip this quickly. I will then add a last thing here where I want to emphasize uh, also from an empirical point of view, this role of things being in sync and in anti-sync. This gets a bit more abstract, but I think it really that type of work really makes the point very nice. Uh, this is a, a bandpass filtered EEG. The, the gray lines here show each channel. And you just by eye, you see that we have a lot of synchronization. Okay, we have a 
a concentration of zero crossings. Here we have moments of time where all electrodes either have a peak or a trough. This is nicely organized in time. Okay, when you compute what is called the global field power, the standard deviation across electrodes, you get a very modulated curve. That means that we have moments in time where all electrodes are nearly flat, and we have other moments in time where all electrodes are nearly peaking or having a trough. Okay, and this is again fundamentally compatible with this freeze model that things are either in phase or in antiphase. Okay, and we can now grab another piece of EEG here where this a fine grained temporal structure is destroyed. Okay, this is the same bandpass filter, but things look really messy here. Okay, this at each moment in time, you will find an electrode that is having a peak or a trough. And this is also something that can be translated to the source level. Okay, the, 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 source, the different sources that contribute to this EEG are not well structured in their phase. Okay, they may, they may be in phase or in antiphase or in any other phase that, that you can think of. Okay, so we, we have developed a measure that we call global field synchronization that distinguishes between this case here Things are either in phase or in antiphase, and not, not much else. And this case here, where anything goes basically in terms of phase. And we can again relate this to this type of pattern here. That pattern here would basically co be compatible with these dynamics, whereas this pattern here is incompatible with, with these dynamics here. Okay, and we many, many years ago, we published a, a paper where we looked at this measure of global field synchronization in patients with dementia. There's a, a two large data sets that we had here from New York, um, from the group of Roy John, where we see this steady decrease of this synchronization here in the alpha range. Okay, the, the more impaired these patients were, the, the less synchronized the EEG was in the alpha range and in the data from the Karolinska Institute from Vesna Jelic. Here we see a similar pattern when they start to have a clinically relevant cognitive impairment. We see a decrease here of this synchronization, namely in the alpha range. Okay, and then we, we keep having this collaboration with the people from Stockholm here with the Karolinska Institute. And there's a paper out now by Una Smailovic, a, a very talented uh, PhD student, or she just got her PhD from, from Vesna, and she has data with uh, many imaging modalities and many clinical features also. And she also has resting state PET data from these patients. Okay, and what you see just when you look at the PET data is that you have a decrease in, in uh, glucose consumption here, namely in the parietal and temporal lobes in the patients with Alzheimer's disease. This is an old, uh, long known finding. Okay, and she also had EEG from these patients. And what we did here is now we computed uh, the connectivity of these regions here with based on inverse solutions um, with the rest of the brain. So each region here was correlated in the frequency that, or was with the connectivity of each of these regions here with the rest of the brain was computed in the frequency domain. And we used two measures now. There's this synchronous measure are things either in phase or in antiphase. This is something that is typically condemned in a lot of the community because it is confounded with volume conduction. And we use this lagged measure of connectivity here. This is what is typically being used when people want to get completely rid of volume conduction. Okay. And we found that this synchronous measure, the measure that is uh, compatible with the freeze model, correlated positively with the uh, sugar consumption in these regions here. So the, the, the more synchronized the EEG or the, the activity of, of these 
parietal and temporal regions where with the rest of the brain, the more sugar consumption and the more intact or the more active, metabolically active these regions were, okay? And at the same time, we found negative correlations here in the theta band. That means the more of this desynchronized, non incompatible with the freeze model type of activity that we have here, the less uh, sugar consumption we had in these regions here. And theta band activity in dementia is, is a classical sign. This is very well known that we have the slowing, that we have this abnormal theta activity here in patients with dementia that we don't see in, in healthy subjects. So this lagged type of connectivity that is so often used in EEG to me seems to be something that is actually quite unnatural and quite dysfunctional. And the, the synchronous type of, of interactions here that we make a story of when we talk about microstates, uh, this is something that seems to be really related to, to functioning. And, and, and this data here is clearly pointing in this direction. Okay. So I think. This is where I then want to end. This is the conclusion slide here. I, I think we are in a very productive domain, a research domain worldwide. This is the, uh, num the number of publications per year, the sum of citations per year. When I did the graph in the beginning of 2019, this is how it looked like. The red curve is what you would expect if you see, if you just take the average increase of publications and citations per year in science in general. So we're moving about twice the speed when it comes to the EEG microstate literature. And, and I'm at the moment in, at, at the position where I start to lose the overview of what all the things that are going on. But I think we, we have something here, signature of global transient and adaptive gating mechanism that are interesting to understand. And we may also influence these adaptive and maladaptive cognitive states as we see them, for example, in psychosis. And to end, I want to uh, advertise a conference that we will hold. This is still an old slide. I need to change this. Uh, this was obviously not possible to hold the conference. Now we moved this uh, to end of August 2022. Uh, and it will take place in Bern, where we will try to gather all the people who work on these EEG microstates to join forces to better understand the phenomena that I try to present to you now. Okay, and that's it, what I had prepared. Thank you very much, Thomas. <laughs> Thank you for this very nice <laughs> overview, trying to link the different type of theories that might underlie uh, the microstates. Uh, are there questions in the audience? Or you have to think a little bit about? <laughs> Otherwise, I, I would like to discuss one thing. There is... Petra, uh, uh, Petra lifted yeah. her hand, so... Sorry? I, I... Petra, yes, please. You're muted. Sorry, there's just an uh, announcement. I hope it's okay. I'm in Lucern. Thank you very much. This was really interesting because, I mean, the whole theory of um, when consciousness emerges in the in the in the newborn or in the in the early child is, of course, of of, of importance and. And given our our results that we get both from fMRI and EEG, it seems that this early integration is actually earlier present than than expected. So you would actually uh, put your conscious state earlier into the feed, late fetal or, or or early neonatal period. <laughs> And uh, in that regard, uh, you know, there's lots of ways of trying to, to address this question. And, mm -hmm. and one of them is this emergence of delta brushes or delta peaks or, or mm -hmm. the emergence of the gamma uh, mm -hmm. band. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering to what extent you would link that to the emergence of the microstates or how, how do the, the emergence or the changes in the actual bands relate to the microstates? 
And that is an issue that is where we still have uh, really work to do, right? And this is something that is opening up at the moment quite a lot. Thomas Roth is working on this. We also have developed methodology to, to, to take this into the time frequency domain. At the moment, we, we really go broadband, and that kind of kills this frequency information. And this is really still a weakness, right? And, and, and I think there is an, an endless amount of really interesting things to do. You, you can easily translate the, the model that we have in time domain into time frequency domain where we have oscillations or really long time oscillatory events that are, from the, from, from the theoretical point of view, totally into this microstate type or, or freeze type account of things. But they may overlap in time. There may be a gamma wave that works in this way. And at the same time, there may be something slow or something in, in other frequencies. And we may easily I mean, I mean, not easily, but, but I think it's accessible also to study the interactions among these. Is a certain pattern of slow stuff actually triggering or temporarily related to something happening in the, in the fast frequencies and all this? This is extremely interesting. And this is something I think where the, where the future lies, but we haven't worked on this so much. There's a lot of interest also in sleep. At the moment, where we have similar things, right? And so far, these sleep people nearly fainted when I said, let's do a microstate analysis and let's apply a 1.5 hertz high pass filter. Okay, then we really destroy something where they have been working on for, for decades. And we can do this, but we, we need to. We, we need to develop the methodology in, the, in that direction. And the newborns are extremely interesting in, in this. I, I perfectly agree on this. This is just very anecdotal. We, we did with, with a, a doctor from Italy, we, we, we did a microstate analysis and she had preterm and normally or preterm babies at different times, the multi-channel EEG. And there was a, it seems like there was a, a major shift in, in these microstates around the time when they were supposed to be born. So I always thought that this is really worth going into, but I never had the, the option. And I, I, I think that you're really onto something that is worth looking at. Yeah. We have the data, Peter, we just have to analyze it. No? <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And we can do this. I mean, and you really in, uh, the invitation is there to do this time frequency stuff on, on this data. The tools are there, and the, the the motivation is there. We can really work on this. I might come back to you if yeah. <laughs> you take up the data that's already yes. there. <laughs> yes. Okay. Are there other questions in the audience? I'm looking at around. Maybe, Christopher, I have one question. Or yes, Patrick. Um, so I was interested by your correlation in Alzheimer's disease between mm -hmm. the hypometabolism and the mm -hmm. frequency. Band. Have you looked at any other region that even showing no decrease in uh, mm -hmm. metabolism could have a connectivity pattern in mm -hmm. a slightly different band? For example, if you're taking cingulate cortex, will you find more theta positive correlation? Now this was really this was really selective, okay. It was selective for those the, the, the correlations that we found were really really selective for those regions where we actually had the hypermetabolism. Okay. Yeah, and then I mean this is a the study has limits. It, it this is a nineteen channel EEG, so if we want to be into localization, we were not very precise, right? We, we took these huge chunks of regions of interest to, 
to do this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? Otherwise, I would like to make one comment that you that you said, which I think is, is very important, where you said that uh, that lacked connectivity between mm -hmm. brain areas is unnatural or is, mm -hmm. is non-functional or rather reflects non-functionality. Now, 99% of the functional connectivity analysis in EEG is only looking at lacked mm -hmm. activity. They actually, they ignore zero phase activity mm -hmm. because this is due to volume conduction mm -hmm. and this is a smearing effect. Mm -hmm. So they ignore it actively by doing the calculation. Mm -hmm. That means would you then go so far and I would <laughs> go with you so far mm -hmm. that <laughs> that this type of analysis of lacked connectivity, being it Granger causality or whatever, mm -hmm. is actually reflecting only a little part or a most unrelevant part of brain activity. Or how far would you go? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I tend to believe that simultaneous things that happen within this time when the same time window and that have uh, the time delays or lag or phase shifts that are not close to zero or to 180 degrees are problematic for a system that is supposed to integrate information. I, I, I really make that point. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I, th I think this, this whole debate about the role of face is not taking place at all. It's totally driven by some mathematical needs of getting rid of volume conduction and the, the, the whole discussion about the functional, the fu functional con consequences of these assumptions has not been made at all, which I find is, is not good at all for, for, for the community. That's one point. And then, I mean, when we look at, uh, at microstate transitions, for example, we also talk about delayed interactions. And if you then do this in frequency analysis, all that this kind of translates into phase relationships in a way that is unclear to me. So it's not all bad, okay? But maybe then in these cases, we would have discrete uh, elements that happen at different times and the mm. FFT would in some way account for this. So the, the, the model or the FFT would capture this and represent this but in, in a way that is misleading also in, in, the, in the interpretation that we make. Yeah, right? I see. Okay. So we've seen this in other studies where we looked at uh, connectivity uh, at, at these measures when it comes, for example, to the presence of auditory verbal hallucinations, frequency domain data in, in steady state about potentials in patients who hallucinate and who don't. And I don't have the results precisely in mind, but when you use the non-lagged and the lagged type of connectivity analysis, you come up with opposite results. Mm -hmm. Some people will say, oh, there's an increase of connectivity between the auditory cortices. And other people will say, no, 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 there's a decrease. And this all can be accounted for by the same data. And it's just accounted for by a different choices of, of, of models of connectivity. Yeah, uh, uh, I and we need to be very careful about this, and we mm -hmm. need to look at this in, in very much detail. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And this is not being take. This is not taking place. No, in contrary, if you try to publish something with unlacked, mm -hmm. you just try. It just takes a while. Takes yeah, a while you to just get, get you just get shot. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, if there are no other questions, I will give them the. Parallel back to, to Pina to the next steps. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas uh, and uh, Christoph, for this great, great talk. And uh, now I open the floor to the audience and invite you to share with us uh, any news that uh, maybe is going on in your labs or in, the, uh, in your environment. Uh, this is really your opportunity to uh, share with the CIBM community uh, any news and events, as Thomas did. <laughs>